Hi everyone. Let's uh, talk a little bit about your reading from Ethics from the Margins. So we'll do a little bit of catch up because I was away last week. Um, and I want to connect this to a couple of different things that we've talked about in the class and what you're reading this week. So we've talked about uh, the, the virtues of biblical interpretation. How do we avoid some of the problems that we've had in history uh, in interpreting the scripture because we come to it with a certain lens or a certain uh, perspective and that perspective colors the way that we interpret the scripture and so uh, one of the virtues of interpretation is uh, putting our best interpretation in a diverse community of interpreters this does a couple of things for us uh, the first thing that it does it it helps us to avoid confirmation bias so when we put our best interpretation into a conversation with others who don't necessarily see things like we do, um, it, help us, it helps us to avoid confirmation bias. That is, uh, putting our interpretation uh, together with people who always agree with us so then we stop thinking about uh, the different challenges to that, um, that interpretation. The second thing that it does, it helps us to see scripture from a different angle. Um, it draws us into the body of Christ so that we can see from a different perspective how a passage may be interpreted. In other words, if you're a part of majority culture or the dominant culture, that helps it get to define um, what is appropriate. Let's say the academy or in uh, you know the continent of Europe uh, in theology, etc. Then uh, you need to hear from people uh, that don't get to define that who actually have to live with the definitions. So that's what Miguel de la Torre and Emily Towns and Marsha Riggs are arguing for is we need to hear the perspectives from those that don't get to define the boundaries for us. Um, and we need to look at scripture in that way. It also, one of the things that it does, it acknowledges a communal formation of our rationality and our morality and we've talked about that when we've talked about McIntyre's definition of a tradition that we always view scripture morality ethics rationality from somewhere that we don't have this universal perspective or a God's eye view and so we need a diverse community to help us see things from a different angle so what ethics of on the margins is trying to do is uh, is trying in those three articles is just give a taste of recovering the voices and the perspectives of those who have been mi marginalized or minoritized especially in the west so we what we want to do is we want to move our ethics and moral formation from uh from the theoretical which the majority culture can uh theorize about what's good and what's true and what's beautiful to a more embodied ethic that is uh, an ethics from below. That's what De La Torre argues for, is the ethics from uh, below. And uh, in all three of those articles, what you see is kind of a push for us to identify with uh, those people who Jesus most identifies with in the pages of the gospel. And when you read uh, Ethics from the Margin, when you look at politics, when you uh, see, especially as people grapple for what is good in society and how do we distribute the goods of society generally what tends to happen is people who are in the majority tend to drift towards the law and the letters those help to define the boundaries of what it means to be faithful what an ordered society looks like etc etc but people on the underside of power tend to drift towards the prophets and um, the gospels because in those, in the prophets and the gospels, you see a kind of a push on the boundaries of ordered, quote unquote, ordered society in order to uh, be more inclusive and to be uh, more diverse. And so you get this kind of example uh, when you read the three articles. And you see this in, especially in the Ethics from the Margins, you see this in Isaiah 58. You see this in Micah 6. You see this in Isaiah 61 and how Jesus picks up on it in Luke chapter 4 when he announces the kingdom of God. Um, so you see examples of this in those uh, a couple of articles. 
And so what we want to do is we want to begin, and your readings uh, for the next couple of weeks will be on um, people from the margins. So you'll read Andrew Sung Park's uh, Racial Conflict and Healing, and that's a Korean-American perspective, and then Randy Woodley's book, um, Shalom and the Community of Creation. And that's, uh, that's from an indigenous people's perspective. So one of the things that uh, when you read ethics from the margins in uh, communities that are arguing for their rightful place in the conversation, um, the first thing that comes uh, from them is a focus on liberation. That is a freedom from sin, both uh, personal sin, but more often it's uh, freedom from systemic institutional injustice and sin. And so you see that very clearly in Miguel de la Torre's um, book, Ethics from the Margins. So this is a focus not necessarily on the guilt or the shame that personal sin will bring, but on the consequences of sin on one's own life. How they are prevented from flourishing because of another person's choices of sin or because of an institution or a system's uh, choices of sin. So let me read a couple quotes. Uh, the first one is from Frederick Douglass. This is in a speech that he gave in 1883 after the Civil Rights Act was overturned, the first one. It was reinstated in 1960s. But he says this about the black experience in America. We have been as a class grievously wounded, wounded in the house of our friends. And this wound is too deep and too painful for ordinary and measured speech. And you'll read in Racial Conflict in, in Healing that Koreans have a word for this. Um, it's very hard to describe and difficult to describe in English, but Koreans have a wor uh, one word for this. It's called Han. And uh, Park gives a definition of Han that it's a sense of unresolved resentment against injustice suffered. A sense of helplessness because of the overwhelming odds against one. A feeling of acute pain of sorrow in one guts and bowels, making the whole body writhe and wriggle. And an obstinate urge to take revenge and to right the wrong of all these combined. So you have this, uh, this oppression and injustice that comes from sin. It begins with sin of individuals or a group of individuals or community, but it can get embedded in a system. It can get embedded into a structure. And that can have consequences generationally. And so uh, Miguel de la Toro will talk about uh, this idea of liberation from sin. And he will mention in there that uh, this liberation from sin is a move towards human flourishing. That we want people to experience the kind of life that Jesus offered and to flourish as human beings. And so we're going to work on those systems and those structures and the injustice that's embedded in them that's preventing people from having a voice and preventing people from flourishing. You'll also see that uh, De La Torre talks a lot about social lo location. This is, again, kind of uh, hearkening back to what we've talked about with McIntyre, that you always have a view from somewhere and that our social location Whatever that might be, whether it's a class location, whether it's an ethnic location, um, whether it's an international location, that um, you you have a perspective on Christian ethics that um, that location shapes you. And so we want to be in conversation with uh, people from different social locations uh, so that we can see things differently. I want to talk a little bit about uh, social location and how we view the good news of the gospel. Let's see if I can do that in a couple minutes um, here so this lecture doesn't get too long. So I'll post these notes, um, but I was just thinking about the good news of the gospel in a cross-cultural context. So uh, for majority culture, for the incarnation, you see uh, usually they view God, uh, the incarnation as God in humanity. With miracles, miracles prove the divinity of Jesus. With Jesus' teachings, uh, they define the boundaries of the kingdom. And they often focus the majority culture, like I said, on law, the law and the letters. In Jesus' life, it's perfect and sinless. 
It fits into the judicial metaphor of the atonement, retributive justice. For the cross, uh, Jesus suffers for us because in majority culture throughout history, we're accustomed to um, people suffering for um, an ordered society or suffering for us. And in the resurrection, this proves Jesus' power to redeem humanity. And the focus is on uh, heaven and eternal salvation. And De La Torre talks a lot about uh, that and trying to walk that back. Um, for minority or minoritized cultures, the incarnation is a symbol of God with humanity. Not just God in humanity, but God with humanity. The miracles prove Jesus' compassion for the downtrodden, that he heals uh, people. He casts out demons because he has uh, passion, compassion for them. The teachings of Jesus shatter the boundaries of inclusion and justice. The life of Jesus is a vulnerable life, uh, not just a sinless life, but a vulnerable life. He identifies with the oppressed and, li and he lived justly. It fits with the Christus Victor model of the atonement that Jesus conquers sin and injustice. The, in the cross, in minority cultures, Jesus suffers with us. And the cross uh, also reveals humanity's violence towards one another. And then again in the resurrection, this proves that Jesus has power over evil and sin. So the focus is not necessarily on uh, the eternal life or the life yet to come, but it is working with God and working with Jesus on this project here on earth to overcome evil and sin. So we have this idea and um, we want to recover this these voices from minoritized cultures in helping to shape our ethics because we need this uh, we need this picture of who Christ is. I'll stop there. I want to talk about um, how this picture fits into the article that you're reading that I wrote on Genesis and the abundant life and the five relationships that we have. But we'll probably talk about that on Wednesday. I'll post a lecture on that on Wednesday.